Welcome to another edition of the audio narration of Battle Royale. I am Dawkins, and I will be narrating this part for you. Part 22, Strike of the Wobegong. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Redditors of all ages. This is your host, Kirby ATK48. Firstly, I want to thank T-Pang for graciously allowing me to narrate this part of the Battle Royale. I narrate with a mostly factual emphasis, though I use some wording to make it a bit more than X did Y. I will use some stories, but mostly in relatively unimportant things that don't actually pertain to the game in any way. Shameless plug here, if you haven't checked out Civ AI Games, I highly recommend it. You will find plenty of AI games narrated by the whole community of people there, just waiting to be read. Alright, shameless plug over, onwards to the battle. Firstly, here is an amazing map by Cylon L, with added cities by Alexarix Ariskel, that shows how the world looks as of right now, turn 256. Onwards to the show! If you didn't see it in the background of last part, Norway has declared war on both the Nazis and the Jews. Yes, they actually did declare war on two civilizations at the same time. They are Snorway no longer. The war with Israel isn't super important, but the one with Germany is. My guess is the Norwegians want Hamburg again. Luckily this time they are equipped with caravels. Also if you didn't notice from the last part, Canterbury is officially Irish. This leaves England with only three cities and a small one-tile passage through the English Channel. Australian privateers, caravels, and galeuses continued their assault of mainland Japan, but with their current forces size, I doubt they will be able to hold onto any of these cities. The lack of land units, yes, I understand there is a long swordsman chilling near Nagoya, is alarming, due to Japan actually having room to take back any cities with land units. Here lie the remains of the once great Sioux Empire. You know, at one point they were ranked fifth in the power rankings, but now they are banished to a useless island in the north. Note, Texas musket men could do some damage, considering I see a total of one Mexican, zero Blackfoot, zero American, and five Canadian musket men here. That's it. Unless I counted wrong, Admiral Cloudberg, you're my fact checker. This part so point out anything I mess up. The Buccaneers retain Ujmal for now, as William Kidd, a famous Scottish privateer, decides it's his turn to lead the pirates. Also, note the outrageous amount of Hawaiians. Everywhere. They couldn't do much to the Inca, with that awesome army and all, but could shred through the Mayans if they so pleased. A relevant story about a sad Argentinian pikeman. We sat, huddled in our shack, if you could even call it that. There are eleven of us, all huddled around the shack, all staring at the middle of the shack. My good buddy Javier Machinaro sat next to me, smoking an old wooden pipe. Sergio Romero, a guy embler, sat across from me giving me dirty looks now and again. And then there was Angel Di Maria, one of the younger soldiers. He held himself. We were weak. We were alone. We were trapped in the middle of an Amazon war. The Brazilians and Incas charged past. We ducked, pretending like it would help. The nearby town of Fortaleza was a strong Brazilian outpost in this war. We saw many a soldier march by with a crossbow in hand. We saw many battalions come back, tattered and weak. We just wanted to be home, but we couldn't leave, surrounded by war. So we stayed, starved, wished we were dead. And then the worst part was, in the middle of the tent, lay the body of my squad leader, my role model, mi padre. Anywho, the Chilean backdoor squad boasts caravels now, as much of the world does, but also boasts a powerful land carpet of composite bowmen, which yes, technically are fairly obsolete. They could do some serious damage to the barren Argentinian lands if they so chose to do so, though. A golden age has dawned upon us, Babylonian brethren, as the world continues plummeting into chaos. We remain safely idle in our endeavors. Our people have started watching Avatar, The Last Airbender, and endless John Cena videos, allowing a new golden era of ideas and beautiful, beautiful content. In the words of the great Monty Python, And there was much rejoicing. Senshi's note, it's a long story, that was actually our glorious, bountiful golden age ending. I guess T-Peng somehow found out about, um... Yeesh. Well, I guess it does explain why we don't get to see what a certain spy uncovered in the sly. 
Also, I spotted six Canadian musket men in slide five. Remember that Kimberly settler we saw earlier? Like last part earlier? The one that went to settle a useless snow city in the middle of nowhere? Well, they did it. And what a city at that! Wollongara sounds like a lovely place to live. Note, the tracker has been upgraded to a rifleman unit. The Kimberly Rifleman is actually a pretty scary development. If they were to invade Australia with land units, they should, in theory, have the tech advantage. And across the ocean, the Hawaiian crossbowmen look far less majestic than the Kimberly Rifleman. Note, Hawaii are playing dirty sending a composite bowman to every island they can find so that they, and only they, can settle the precious one-tile islands. No, don't worry, I didn't miss it last slide, just wanted to point it out here. The Vietnamese and Filipinos make peace. I mean, not like it matters considering the Champa got the prized possession of Manila, but whatever. You do you, Trunk Sisters. Here it is, the supposed last Filipino unit, a sad composite bowman. They seek refuge in the great well, yeah, right, Indonesian Empire, specifically in Borneo. They find it for now. Meanwhile, in the ever oddly shaped Finnish Empire, the Huns have been repelled, mostly. San Bartola is basically insecure Finnish bear claws, and Jonsu has yet to see an actually powerful Hunnic assault. The whole horse archer versus cannon thing probably isn't working out, Attila. Irrelevant story of the lonely Norwegian, I think, scout. There I was, trekking through eastern lands, beyond Sweden, yes, even beyond Finland. I know hard to imagine a world past the superpower of Finland. I had marched for many days through unknown territory. My assistant mapped out our progress up through the snowy wastelands, some place called the USSR. At least that's what the people in Stalingrad said. We trekked east, even past the USSR, reaching oddly more Finnish cities. Hard to imagine they don't control everything. But then... Then... We met those I couldn't even fathom before. Brutes. Monsters of men. Men who raped, pillaged, raised cities as they pleased. These were not civil men, like us classy Norwegians. But I trekked onwards not wanting to stop at these, these Huns. But then I reached a great mountain. I climbed a nearby hill, hoping to find a way around. But instead I found war, Finnish war. War with other large brutes I didn't yet know. Then it hit me. These Hunnic brutes really were evil. Why else would the Finns and other brutes try to conquer them? Fire lay everywhere. Bodies, blood, frozen pikes. Odd to see, really. Fire in such a frozen wasteland. Ha <laughs> ha, back again. While Finland did indeed just capture the Polish city of Poznan, the Polish counterattack is still there. Finland will have to keep sending troops through the Soviet citadels to keep Poznan Finnish. Also, the Finnish, too, indeed, have quite a range of troops as trebuchets and cannons push onwards together into Polish lands. Finnish troops also decide to commit to a mass exodus through the Soviet territories towards their eastern colonies. The Huns better watch out. Note, apparently onwards isn't a word, even though I use it all the time. Whoops. Hitler and Napoleon start trading? I mean, I can get the whole let's make peace so we can focus on other wars thing, but now they're being bros? Nope. I don't like it one bit. Also of note is the complete lack of Norwegian ships attacking Hamburg. Cologne I can understand due to that one obnoxious tile of France in the middle of the ocean, but Hamburg should be easy pickings. However, Norway's Scandinavian neighbors, Sweden, seem to know what's up as they continue to land troops in northern Germany. In one of the greatest and craziest wars yet, Australia attacks Yakusha. Now, I know what you're all thinking, young Padawans. But Master Kirby, they don't even share any borders. This war is useless. Oh, great point, young Padawan. However, remember the whole Australian superpower thing? The whole Pacific gangbang on the Philippines? Yeah, that? Well, this war is there merely to send a message to the, oh, I don't know, 57 civilizations below Australia in the power rankings. Yakusha is the enemy. Loud and clear, 
from the Australians. Now we look to the current second place in the power rankings, the Inuit, whose ice sheet fleet has grown exponentially recently, and now includes all three modern ships, the Caravelle, Frigate, and Privateer. Meanwhile, back in Europe, Hitler makes peace with England, probably to deal with the other three neighboring civilizations at war with him. Sibir continues to charge through the Ural Mountains, to little success. Sibir is way more tech-savvy than their Hunnic counterparts, so it's only a matter of time before they rush into Kekon and Viraconium. Oh look, I found a letter from one Hamilcar Barca, a new general of Sibir. Warning, all Carthage supporters are highly recommended to skip this part. Dear Hannibal, my son, oh how I wish I could be in arms next to you fighting side by side against those Ayupid pigs. Oh, how I wish I could slaughter our enemies and take everything that is rightfully ours. Oh, how I didn't wish you didn't know what you were doing. Hannibal, my son, I wish you the best of luck in your endeavors, but I must leave. By the time you read this, I will be halfway through Sparta. Your ignorance of technology will be your downfall, and ultimately, I can't bear to watch my greatest son be slain by some technologically advanced other great of this world. I have fled to Sibba, a strong civilization who knows what the crap they are doing. Hopefully, by the time our borders meet, only we shall remain. I offer you the best of luck in your conquests. Your father, Hamilcar Barca. P.S. You suck. Get over it. Yakusha adopts autocracy as well, joining the ideology train of not going against the endless tourism of Australia. But far more importantly... The Inuit attack! The number two and three civilizations in this game, at least according to my power rankings of power rankings, gotta love those shameless plugs, are now at war. And they share borders. The Inuit made the smart move, going with the initial attack, otherwise the Yakushians would have it way too easy. However, their fleet is a bit out of the ways off, and they probably should have waited a turn or two before attacking. There is also a one-tile choke point to get into the Sea of Oshkosh, where all of the Yakushian boats are, not allowing a powerful Inuit navy to attack the coastal cities of <laughs> Gotta love those names, they're a real mouthful. The Yakushians, on the other hand, have a strong navy nearby and can easily do more damage to the Inuit colonies. The Maori are up to muskets as they continue to expand their tech and population. The Maori are a great underdog in this game, starting on a relatively small island with almost no room to expand. However, their population is giving them a huge tech boost that could help them, you know, if they weren't bordered by two of the top ten most powerful civilizations on the entire globe. In my experience with AI games, the island civilization never wins though, so good luck Maori fans. Ah, uh, the Champa, one of my favorite civilizations, truthfully mainly due to their gorgeous colors. They are beautiful. However, they are literally an entire era behind the top contenders of the world. They need to step up their tech game if they want any chance of making it to the end. Note, Filipino composite bowman is still there. Whew. Note, note. Something I don't think a lot of people have thought about is the possibility that a lot of civilizations simply won't be eliminated. Byzantium, for example, may last a really long time due to one simple fact. They have no capital to take. This game is about capitals, and so long as a civilization gets all of those, it doesn't matter if the rest are fully eliminated. Many civilizations will indeed be left with one or two useless cities, looking at Yusu or Byzantium as examples. Poland continues attacking Poznan, so dearly wanting it back. However, they are also still dealing with Hitler, alongside the Swedes, and so far are doing so rather unsuccessfully. I gotta say, for being at war with basically everyone, Hitler is doing fan-freaking-tastic. Note, a Yubid prophet in Sparta, near Corinth. Why is it not converting people instead of wandering around the world? I have no idea. Just wanted to check in on our favorite basically city-state, China. Oh, and the fairly useless Tibet, and fairly boring Mongolia, and fairly dim at Yakusha. You get the idea. This area of the world is boring as watching C-SPAN. Sorry to any American politicians I may have just offended. I mean, look at Mongolia's army. They could wipe through all of China in a matter of turns, even if Mulan taught me that China wins in the end. However, they choose to do nothing. The Kesha carpet is real. Just use it. The Yubas are getting royally squashed, like hardcore. Squashed like a grape that just let out a little wine. 
no apologies for that one, from all of its pain. Note, the Congo captured Diradawa. This actually happened in the background of the statistics at the end of part 21, but no slide actually showed it until now. The Congo leaf people continue their assault on Zabid, while the Ayubids do everything they can to stop everyone everywhere attacking them all the time. And here is the Boar unique unit, the Commando. They are faster Gatling guns that can move after attacking, and cost less to make. However, they are just a tad bit weaker in combat to compensate. These guys will give the Zulu Impi a run for their money. Note, if I was the Boers, I would have dropped a Citadel so fast to steal Kilimanjaro. However, unlike the Boers who only have a few of their unique units, the Mali have spammed the crap out of theirs, the Sofa. No, not a couch, you imbeciles. The Sofa starts with the Medic promotion and may move after attacking. They are also stronger while defending. However, like the Boer Commando, they do lose a bit of strength when attacking. Mali, if they really wanted to, could wipe the floor with Morocco. They simply have to expand in all directions while the Moroccans have to protect a few colonies. The Buccaneers finally start landing more and more land troops in South America to hold off the endless Brazilians at their border. Note, Paznan also falls to Poland. This is not captured anywhere else in a screenshot, so I simply mention it and leave it at that. If I may, dear Sparta fans, I would like to evaluate the current condition of Sparta. Now let me set this straight first and foremost. I love Sparta. I think they are an awesome civilization and can't wait for them to be released. Now with that said, here in the Battle Royale I think they have been always a little overrated. Let me explain. They have done very well in the power rankings because they were expanding rapidly, conquering much of Italy, Anatolia, and a few islands here and there. This makes logical sense. He who kills is he who wins this game. However, even with their conquests, they still lacked what every other strong empire has, and that is simply land. Their cities are too close together for insane population like the Maori or Australias have. When they expand, they have to expand literally everywhere around them because they have no natural borders to protect them. They have several weak civilizations around them, yes, this definitely helps their case, but they can't fight all at once. Take Ravenna, Rome, and Antium as perfect examples. They got attacked by all and converted Italy into a mass of city-states. I admire their tenacity, but I never believe they were as powerful as people made them out to be. Disagree with me. Go ahead. Like I said, I love Sparta. think they have great potential as a strong European Mediterranean power, just not on a global scale. That's all. The Australians decide one crappy Antarctic city isn't enough and establish the city of Shepparton as well. Also, a Chilean settler decides to join the party. Nottingham falls back to England. Man, those long bowmen are ridiculously OP here in crowded Europe. England, while seeming like they are on their last legs of life, are being surprisingly adept at attacking and taking back old cities of theirs. The Vietnamese finally reach the industrial era, only a step behind the others. They have a large army still attacking China, but are otherwise unprotected. The Trunk Sisters are doing swell overall, but I think some more army wouldn't hurt. Note, Paznan has fallen back to the finish. Check the mini-map, it doesn't get mentioned elsewhere, I just noticed it here. The Australians continue to hammer away at Tokyo and Osaka as Wakayama falls. They won't hold it for long, but they are indeed hurting Japan very badly. The Zulus have so many impis, so many. They need to impy rush Boxburg and possibly even Johannesburg if they want any chance of staying in this game. If not, I'm afraid they shall suffer the same fate as they did in Battle Royale MK1. The Texans and Sioux make peace. Not super relevant anymore, but still, glad to see Sitting Bull is getting cut some slack. A relevant story about Irish Scout in Blackfoot Lands. He wanders among us, a strange man. He is not from here. He does not know the land, he does not know the wars, he does not know the ways. He is not Texan nor Canadian, no, we have seen both. Red hair coats his gigantic form, we do not dare interfere with him, for he could wrestle any one of us with ease. He sits and writes with paper often, unaware he is being tracked, unaware he is in our lands, unaware he is trespassing on holy ground. Nonetheless, we shall continue to follow him. See where his adventure leads. See if he finds what he is looking for. Ah, the sea of weak civilizations. Burma, Sri Lanka, Champa, and sadly, the Mughals. 
Yes, all four of these civilizations have slipped behind their Afghan and Vietnamese neighbors. These civilizations still use triremes and pikemen for Pete's sake. I predict none of them winning, straight up. And note, I actually do support the Mughals since day one of Mark One. Sad to see them get wrecked here pretty badly. In AI games I've run by myself, they actually did pretty well. Burma got wrecked pretty hard, though. Note, note. The Burmese Great General has no name. That means that all of the Great Generals with names have been spawned somewhere in this world, and all Great Generals from here on out will have no name. The English Caravel strikes again, first taking Nottingham, now taking back Orleans from the French. England should not be actually winning these wars. Get your crap together, Napoleon. Also of note, Portugal and Norway are currently attacking the recently reunited city of Cologne, while Swedes slowly march on Hamburg, as always. The Arabs continue attempting their sad assault on the Ayyubids. After taking Bethlehem, they really can't get to any other city easily. So instead, they embark their amazing camel archers to be destroyed instantly by the nearby Ayyubid cities. Genius! Note, that is a lot of Israeli prophets. Now I see why Judaism is so popular. In case you thought I was ignoring it, here we see that the Ethiopian Ayyubid War has officially ended. The Ethiopian army should have been easily able to smash up against the weak Ayyubid cities, but instead, Haile Selassie, leader of Ethiopia, decided to peace out. Classic AI. Also note Mali attacking Armenia for no reason. Oh, and Carthage totally attacking Vilbase. Mali, while looking super competent and cool, only now reaches the Renaissance era. Carthage decides to attack Israel while Norway joins Mali in attacking the Armenians. Neither war matters, of course, just interesting to note these wars. Also, if you would look to the top of the screen, you will note that Ujmal is once again Mayan. Gotta love Pakal's complete lack of weakness in the endless buccaneer assault. The Mayans are outmanned, outgunned, and out-everythinged, but they are fighting and holding on strong still. Meanwhile, Armenia and Japan both make peace with Hitler, because he is seemingly a nice guy who just wants to spread his love for Judaism with the world. Good luck figuring that one out a thousand years from now, historians. The Australians, meanwhile, have so far failed to take the cities, instead just constantly bombarding Tokyo. Osaka is surrounded by Japanese now, meaning they should be able to keep that, but Meiji's capital is definitely in danger. As the Mayans celebrate their recapture of Ujmal with plenty of party and human sacrifice, the great leader Pakal declares war against the Israeli scumbags. How dare they spread their religion a world away? Catholicism is the one to rule all religions in the Americas, he shouts with vigor. Note, I am not Catholic. Te Reparaha, whose ballad never actually ends, reaches the industrial era. And look at that navy. Right now, I wouldn't doubt if they had a larger navy than Australia. A nice sneak attack into Sydney sounds lovely, but knowing Te, he probably won't budge. The Ayyubids make peace with Arabia, Israel, and Congo, leaving only the nearby Carthage as actually important enemies. Carthage, meanwhile, treks their elephants across the Sahara into the base, as always. Afghanistan and the Inuit also declare war on Israel, useless, while Persia and Mongolia make peace with Hitler. Man, why is everyone making peace with Hitler and not the other way around? A relevant story of Desert Elephant. <laughs> Oh, well, that sounded more like a horse. Apparently that's how you make an elephant noise in English. Thanks, Google. The Yakutians do the first damage of the war as they attack Iglulik with a caravel and knight. The Inuit shouldn't have attacked first while their navy and army was so far away. We may be seeing some Yakut gains here. Also note another war against Israel, this time from the Blackfoot. Australia also attacks Israel as the Hawaiians found the city of Malulani Maka, where the composite bowmen used to be now a crossbowman, so it seems. These Hawaiian islands would be ripe for the picking if only Australia attacked. Note, is it Hawaii or Hawaii? I always spelled it Hawaii, but I've seen it both ways. Australian ships bring Tokyo to near destruction as another wave of naval ships come closer to the battlefield. There's more anti-Israeli hate as the Nazis and Chile both attack. Once again, neither are relevant, but it never seems good to be on the world hate train. Germany is slowly losing their brand new conquest of Cologne to the Portuguese now and Norwegian Galeuses. However, like I've said before, you really do have to give credit to Germany. They had possibly one of the worst starting locations in the game, being squished from every side by other civilizations, then attacked by them at all times. 
they're holding off the Polish Swedish advances fairly easily, so one must admire them for that. Also, if you didn't notice last slide, the Mayans make peace with the Buccaneers. However, instead of giving up Ujmal like you would expect, they give up the city of Tikal, a landlocked city that the Buccaneers had little to no chance of actually getting in the war. Thanks, Hawaiians. This leaves the Mayans with only two cities, completely cut off from each other. Bask in the greatness that is the Icelandic navy. I won't lie, I was skeptical of Iceland joining this game, and as they are an island nation, I don't see them doing much. However, that fleet is freaking massive, and I hope they tear through Canada at least once this game. If they attacked right now, they could easily take Medicine Hat, Sherbrooke, or an Oshawa. Also note the Icelandic city in Greenland chilling with one population. Sorry to anyone who lives there, but that does not look fun. Morocco and the Boers make peace with Sparta, though neither was doing much to Sparta anyways. Japan retakes Wakayama from the Australians, and has managed to plop a privateer right in front of Tokyo. But alas, Japan's days are numbered, as Australian boats just never stop appearing. Period. Chinese knights attack Haolu once again, while a massive Vietnamese force rises from the south. I'm still amazed China is still around, what with Vietnam, Mongolia, and Korea as neighbors. They really should have been eliminated by now. And Zynga leads the Congo to a new era, believing them to be in a boom of technology. She doesn't actually know that most of the world is already at this point in time in said era, and some are even further advanced. Also, Stalin attacks Israel as well. Note, why no World Congress again? Since they reached industrial, there should be one, right? North America has been awfully quiet since the eradication of the Sioux, pronounced Sioux for those of you who are like me and have been calling them the Sioux forever. North America has some of the most powerful civilizations in the world currently, especially the Inuit, Texas, and Canada, who are all current top 10 in power rankings as of Part 21. Brazilian cross bowmen continue to do nothing outside of Machu in the never-ending South American War. There's a reason we all ignore you, South America. This is why. Indonesia also joins in, in the Israeli gangbang while Ireland finally reaches the Renaissance. In a more important turn of events, England makes peace with France, giving up York in the deal. Say what you will about France's incompetence in taking York, they technically did in the end anyways. This leaves England with two English cities in Hastings down in Iberia. Norwegians continue to bombard Cologne, but with the closest caravel near Trondheim, Cologne could remain German for quite some time. Sejong builds the Louvre, giving them a small culture bonus as well as some great work slots. Obviously, this is irrelevant in the grand scheme of a domination-only game, but it is interesting to note that Tiny Korea is up to archaeology and managed to grab a wonder from under the rest of the world's noses. Hawaii also attacks Israel. So much hate on the Israelites. To be fair, I count five Israeli scouts in Korea, Mongolia currently, so maybe that's why people hate them. No one likes a global NSA. Also, if you didn't notice, Tokyo is down to red, with hardly any chance of staying Japanese for much longer. Yakut ships attack the northern cities of the Northern Empire. However, a lone valiant Inuit privateer stands in their way. Overall, this war is pretty even stalemate across the board, as Yakut and Inuit boats kill each other for a few tiles of advancement. Why Australia has yet to take Tokyo and Wakayama again beats me. The most powerful civilization in the world can't even take a few Japanese cities. Also, personally, I'd be super worried about the nearby Korean Navy, which looks fairly terrifying. Only a little bit. Wow, the Kimberleys sure love their useless one-tile snow city, don't they? They are now sending food via cargo ship to their island of Wulgara, as well as a lone fishing boat across the Atlantic. Vietnam and Japan finally make peace. Vietnam sits peacefully, minus China, in Eastern Asia, controlling one of the largest land areas in all of Asia. The only reason I could see them agreeing to peace is the fact that they share one border tile total. Not a whole ton they can do while Australia is in their way. Why Sibir hasn't wiped through the eastern Hunnic cities, I have no idea at all. The amount of Siberian Tatars should have done some massive damage by now. Unless I'm missing something? Maybe that's it. Meanwhile, the Finnish have successfully repelled the Hunnic assault, and are now marching at an admittedly outdated force through the USSR to attack the Hunnic capital of Attila's court. Note, the irrelevant Norwegian scout is gone. Sad times. Finnish army has approached the Polish capital of Warsaw. It's cannons versus trebuchets, knights versus pikemen, and musketmen versus composite bowmen. This tech gap is unreal. 
Poland held such promise going into this game, what with the earlier Poland strong movements of previous AI games, they simply aren't living up to it. The Ayyubids make peace with another civilization, this time the Armenians, which you can see in the top right corner trekking through Israel. Carthage is still at war with the Ayyubids, however, and Saladin, leader of the Ayyubids, is doing a great job keeping the war elephants at bay. Note, war elephants are actually one of my favorite things about history. Like, how freaking cool would it be to be walking through the downtown of a city, charging through on a giant war elephant? Freaking awesome! That's what it would be. Once again, we check in on our Filipino friend as he makes peace with the Ayyubids as well. Not sure who still is at war with them, hopefully not anyone too important. Like I explained in a comment elsewhere, most likely no one new will attack the composite bowman. Same reason no civilization will attack the Babylonian submarine. Quite frankly, it's because they have nothing important to take. I've watched dozens of AI games and never once seen a civilization attack another with no cities, unless they are already at war, and simply never make peace. Hey, remember the awesome Mughals? Well, their reasoning for attacking Vietnam is now seen here. The city of Sengenzambo, is, which is completely separated from the rest of Vietnam, is looking mighty fine. Akbar wants it for himself. This would be the second originally Tibetan city they would take if they actually do get around to it. However, also note how easily they could take Balkh from the Afghanistan. They might lose Agra in the process, but some of the Afghani cities look really pretty undefended. Just thought I'd remind you all of the glorious Mongolian Empire, full of Keshiks and outdated composite bowmen. Genghis Khan, leader of Mongolia, could easily wipe some near cities off the map right now. Alright, let's play a game. Count the scouts. I count ten. Can anyone beat that? Ireland continues with their assault on England. Admittedly, they should be faring way better than this. This is just sad. England should be gone. I would like to note the current population of London as well, which actually increased one total throughout this part. If you would now shift your gaze to the north, that pesky English caravel is now attacking Galway. How it got past the Irish Navy beats me, but they did, so hashtag get wrecked Malachy. I shall leave you this part with this. Now onwards to the stats. The Maori continue to maintain their lead in population, and actually the entire top six keep their spots from the last time. Everyone up here is expected, except the Maori in Hawaii, of course. Some real world comparisons for you if Battle Royale Civilization equals real world civilization. The Maori have the same population of Colombia, Australia, Spain. Sibir is Algeria, and Vietnam has the same population as Morocco. And here are the dregs of the world. Interestingly, a lot of red-colored civilizations. Fun fact, the Sioux are officially 0.0987% of, of the Maori's population. More comparisons like before. Japan has the same real-world population as Switzerland. Germany, Paraguay. The Huns, Denmark. The Maya, Jamaica. And the Sioux, the Faroe Islands. The top four all remain the same from last time, while the Boers pass Iceland for the fifth largest military. Once again, we see some top civilizations up here, though I won't lie, the Icelandic fleet still surprises me. These civilizations could easily be walked through. Oh wait, three of them already have. Ha! <laughs> One you would never expect to see this low on military are the Huns. Usually they shred. I guess not in this game. Here is something we didn't get to see last part, the total land area. Holy crap, some of these are surprising. The Buccaneers, Maori, Iceland are all in the top 12. That's crazy talk. The rest are expected, but I honestly didn't realize they had so much land. The usual suspects are down here in the bottom of the land area holders. None of these civilizations stand a ton of a chance, but hey, you never know. Korea pulls ahead from the Yakuts in technology while most of the world is close behind. Even the small 5 tech gap between 1st and 11th though, is pretty crazy. That can make the difference real quickly. This part shocks me every part, how low some civilizations are on technology. While Carthage, Arabia, and Mali are some of the mid-tier competitors in this game, they are so freakishly behind in technology that they either have to somehow miraculously catch up or watch as they waste away. I mean, the Mayans are a whopping 15 techs behind the Koreans. That's crazy! The Australians still have the most cities, while the rest of the top 13 are pretty normal to see up here. Meanwhile, five or less cities warrant being in the bottom picture. 
Most of these, again, are fairly useless civilizations that will ultimately get smushed by the bigger civilizations. It's official! Catholicism has officially reached more cities than Judaism. While Judaism still has more followers, the Mexican monopoly on the Americas is too dang big and will ultimately become one of the largest religions in the world. And here is the religion map. It's odd not being able to actually see what the Pacific Islands are due to being one-tile islands, but watching the spread of Catholicism to South America, Judaism to Europe, and Buddhism to Australia has been interesting to see throughout this game. With that, I am signing out for now. Please let me know if I missed anything. 58 Civilizations is a lot to fact check, but I tried my 100% absolute best, best. Or let me know what you thought of my narration. I will always be looking for things to change in my narration, considering I actually narrate other games as well. Thanks to T-Pang for the opportunity to narrate this giant AI game, and thank you to all of you for reading it. Signing out, Kirby ATK 48 and with that, I am Dawkins. Thank you very much for listening to the audio narration. We'll see you next time.